or seven years, and I'm not as it's not as ingrained in my memory mm -hmm. detail wise. So some of it we may have to go back, you know, mm -hmm. and with Deb and go over a map and kind of clarify some things. But I'll give you a general outline, um, and it'll be might be kind of mixed time periods, you know, from Mormon and then post Mormon Irish, but we can start whenever you want. Um, yeah, I don't know if you, if this map would even be helpful or if we should just go with a historical one and you can. Well, we can start, we can start anything. with this one, <laughs> yep. Okay. Start with this and then use a larger map later. So, what's your first heading or what's your, where do you want to start? Um, I guess if you could just, would you be able to show us where particular families settled? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> you draw it, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the the pre-Mormon era, which would be before 1847, mm -hmm. there was a uh, a settlement of migrant fishermen down in Cables Bay, which is in the southeast quadrant of the island, east of Iron Ore Bay, east of the Beaverhead Lighthouse. We don't know a lot about them. We believe there was a sawmill there, um, and they would have been living in pretty rudimentary housing shacks, basically, tar paper shacks and, and um, slab wood shacks on Cables Bay. They would have fished out of there. <clears throat> and we think there was a road that went along that bay right on the beach that was kind of a gravel road that we found remnants of. Uh, one of my interview subjects from the early 1990s who grew up uh, at a little village called Nomad um, just north of Cables Bay, she reported seeing, having come across a small cemetery near Cables Bay mm -hmm. in the sand dune area with little white wooden crosses on it. It has, it has long since disappeared. And we have no official record of that, but it indicates, her anecdotal information indicates that there was a, a village sufficient enough, large enough to have uh, required a cemetery. Mm -hmm. We don't know if that came from the migrant Irish fishermen or the later, uh, the later Mormon settlement, because the Mormons also had a small settlement down here okay. called Galilee. And in fact, they, they attempted to dig a canal between Lake Genezareth and Lake Michigan, perhaps with the idea of allowing larger boats into Lake Genezareth and making an artificial harbor out of it. Um, later on, when the uh, Mormons had left, uh, uh, the, the Irish came in, and some of the uh, Irish settled down here in Greens Bay, so the Green family and I think a couple other families settled here on the central western portion of the island and <coughs> they had a farmstead here near Green's Lake so they were probably fishing out of here and I think I think what they did was they first set up an establishment here on the bay then they moved further inland to the southeast about two miles to Green's Lake where they cleared land and was that, um, were they one of the first Irish families to come after the strange assassination? Yeah, they were an early family. I'm not sure what year they came, but they would have been, I think, with, you know, from 1856 to 1865, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. So we'll have to clarify this later, mm -hmm. too, but I think they started out here on the bay and then moved inland uh, to Greens Lake, and then later on, in the late 1800s, moved up here to Kings Highway, um, roughly right around here, and this was called Greentown. Mm -hmm. So there were two brothers, two kind of patriarchs of the family, and they both had large families, a large number of children. One lived on this side of King's Highway, and one lived over here. Um, so, you know, the, the Irish had a tradition of what they would call townlands, Mm -hmm. uh, in Ireland, and they might be just very small villages that were clustered around that were based on familial ties. 
So it might be like in a large extended family. It might be the Greens and the people, the women that married into the mm-hmm. family and the men that married, you know, married into the family. So a handful of families might be in this area. So to call it a town by today's standards wouldn't, you know, wouldn't really be that large of an area. Mm-hmm. Um, and... On this area here, Slop Town Road, which is in the northern third quadrant of the island, we uh, were a number of farms and farmsteads, and they would have been some of my ancestors, the um, the Boyles and the O'Donnells and, and so forth. And because they most of them came from one island in Ireland and were interrelated, you had a lot of common names. So there might have been you know, five O'Donnell families and eight Gallagher families and, you know, seven Boyle families, and they would have been related. Um, and some of them might not have been that closely related because if some of the families came from mainland Ireland and not Aaron Moore. But mm-hmm. we think that the people, the immigrants on Sloptown Road, came er- earlier from um, Canada, came to Beaver Island through Canada, whereas some of the immigration streams came through New York mm-hmm. and Pennsylvania, and the others came through Canada. And uh, they would have, and this has yet to be established, but there's some evidence to indicate that they, some of these people worked on building a large cathedral yeah. in a town called St. Catharines. St. Catharines later became Toronto. So in those days, Irish immigrant labor was used to build a lot of large structures and uh, canals mm-hmm. and roadways and so forth. And because they were Catholic, they were they were willing and able to uh, to construct you know Catholic churches. And in my own research has shown that there was a small shanty town, kind of like an Irish slum, uh, near St. Catharines in Toronto, that was called Slab Town. And they would have called it Slab Town because they built their um, their ho- their houses or their shacks out of throwaway lumber from sawmills, mm-hmm. from slabs, from mm-hmm. sawmills. So my speculation is that this has not been established either, mm-hmm. it's just strictly my speculation, that Slop Town is, a, is kind of a der- derivation of the village Slab Town, the name okay. Slab Town. But because the Donegal Irish, you know, would have pronounced vowels that differently, it could have gone from Slab Town to Slob, mm-hmm. you know, they would have said Slob Town. Is there any sort of other hypothesis for, as to where that name came from? Yeah, there is. The, the, there's one idea that it was because the road was, all the roads were dirt in those days, and it was a particularly muddy road, um, oh. that it was just really <laughs> sloppy. But, um, or that there were a lot of, because there were a lot of farms, there were a lot of pigs there. Mm-hmm. So they, you know, it was slopping the pigs or pig slop. But uh, yeah. those are possible, so but, possible <laughs> but I, I just kind of think that, given the traditions of the Irish to take names with them, mm-hmm. that it's perhaps more likely that they um, that they moved here and called themselves the, the Slab Town people because they all hailed, they spent several years in that part of Canada. Mm-hmm. So there might have been a little more French influence, French-Canadian influence among these families. Um, to the west of Slab Town Road on Lake Michigan is a, an area called Bonner's Bluff. And uh, that was another family, uh, John Bonner, um, who actually his name would have been pronounced Bonar in Gaelic. Um, he was here. He was a migrant fisherman mm-hmm. in the 1840s. So he was here before Strang, and he was one of the people that were forced out by the Mormon mm-hmm. uh, settlement. And he hung out on an island west of here called Gull Island, and he kind of waited it out. He waited it out, and he, I think, carried information back and forth between Mackinac and uh, other people around the archipelago who were conspiring and waiting for Strang to, to leave. So after Strang was killed, he immediately moved back to this west side of the island and set up a homestead there on the bluff, and he fished out of there, and he built a home um, right around here, and he had two or three sons, and one built the hotel downtown, and uh, one was the last surviving Irish fiddler that I knew in my mm-hmm. lifetime. So you might call that, I don't know if they call that, you know, 
Bonner Town or anything like that. But again, it was an area where there were two or three families mm -hmm. uh, settled with the same familial connection. Um, down here on Hannigan Road, which is a pretty narrow uh, one-track road, essentially, and the center of the island is an east-west road that goes from the end of Kings Highway to Old Fox Lake Road. It's called Hannigan Road, and there were two brothers. One was Tommy Boyle, and I forget his brother's name, but Hannigan, I think, was their nickname. And again, we'll want to confirm that on the historic map to make sure I'm correct about that. So the Irish had a lot of, they were um, really fond of nicknames because they all had such similar names. Mm -hmm. Because there were five O'Donnell families, it could be five Mike O'Donnell. So they would give each other names, like maybe depending on the hair color. Like, for instance, this road, which is now commonly called Barney's Lake Road, was in earlier years, not that long ago, called Darkey Town Road. And it was called Darkey Town Road after uh, Mike O'Donnell, Darkey Mike. But they called him Darky Mike, not because he looked like an African-American person, but because he had dark hair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of the Irish who moved here from Western Ireland had Spanish in blood. Mm -hmm. So they, would, they actually looked darker. Mm -hmm. um, and they would have been called black Irish. Um, they had jet black hair and dark skin. And so that may have also been why he was called Darky Mike. So that was one of the many nicknames you would find here. And again, Hannigan, I think, was a nickname for these, this family. Uh, their mother may have been a Hannigan, or, um, but I'm pretty sure their last name is Boyle. Um, these other points you see named here, Les Point, this was a German-American fisherman who settled in there in, the, I think, the, the turn of the century. Um, McFadden Point, I think, was also an individual. I don't think it was a family there. French Bay, we speculate that French voyageurs uh, had explored this area and mapped it out a little bit and had uh, dug um, some primitive caves into the side of the bluff here to store uh, sailing equipment and food stores and so forth, but we're not sure about that, but it's been called French Bay for a long, long time. Um, Macaulay's were another... Uh, Irish immigrant family from County Donegal, mm -hmm. and they there were several of them, several families. Um, they also had a little fishing uh, establishment set up here, but they later moved inland. Um, the O'Donnell family, Barney O'Donnell, who was an immigrant, lived here and, and farmed the land around Barney's Lake, um, and he was he had quite a large family too. He's the ancestor of quite a few people that are still living here on the island. Um, Looney was a, he was, a, Patrick Looney was a surveyor in 1845 when they first surveyed the island for the federal government. And I don't think he was from Donegal. I think he might have been from mainland Donegal, but mm -hmm. I don't think he was from Aaron Moore. Um, and he had a nephew, Patrick Kilty, this is spelled wrong on this mm -hmm. map, Patrick Kilty, who helped him survey, or Peter Kilty, who helped him survey the island in, in 1845, again, before Strain came. Uh, Point Lepar, and again, I think it's some French influence there that we have to look up. Mm -hmm. Uh, Khan's point, I think, might be referred to uh, Cornelius Gallagher. I don't think it was a proper last name, but they would have called Cornelius Khan as a nickname. So, you know, in the 1850s, uh, and again, there were some Irish immigrants that settled here around Lake Genezareth as well, including some of those on my mother's side. Um, so, some of the place names, I think, have been lost to time if they were ever there at all. Mm -hmm. But what you had earlier on was, for reasons I'm not quite sure of, they possibly because they wanted a lot of space around themselves. They didn't all cluster in the harbor when they settled. Mm -hmm. Many did, but you find the greens down here, and you find you know, some boils down here, and um, I'm curious about that. I, I'd still like to know myself why they 
kept so much space around them because it wasn't easy. There were no roads. There yeah. were very few roads even, you know, um, after the Mormon era. There were some rudimentary roads that, that Natives of the island gathered, but not, it wasn't easy to get around. So it would take you a long time to get <laughs> to get up here mm-hmm. by land, or they would just take their little <coughs> sailboats up here to get provisions and so forth. And they seemed to want to be, you know, kind of separated from each other that way. So I, we're not really sure how much they intermingled in the first, um, you know, generation. It may be that they brought here with them certain, you know, family rivalries or differences, mm-hmm. or it may be that they um, they simply, it, during the Homestead Act era, when the government was giving away land to people just for farming it, maybe that they just saw a certain land they liked and said, we're going to settle in here. And So they had, some of them had very lo- fairly large tracts of land, and the law was that because the government was trying to develop and settle these wilderness areas, on, which was then the frontier you could lay claim to it and own it, put your name on it, simply um, if you could prove that you were using it, farming it. So it, perhaps the Greens just saw this land they thought was fertile over here um, and took it, and, and the same thing for Lake Genesaret with uh, the, mullo- or the, the boils over there. And mm-hmm. Not exactly sure, but there were still, you know, there were a, a good number of Irish families that were settling here in the harbor because... Uh, it was a great natural harbor, mm-hmm. and they had been fishermen in Ireland, but fishing on the ocean is a different situation than fishing on the Great Lakes, so um, they had to, they learned a lot about fishing from the Native American tribes that were still mm-hmm. living here at that mm-hmm. time, and many of the third generation uh, Irish on the island credit the natives, credit the Indians with really helping them to survive. Um, and the sand, the soil was sandy. It wasn't the best soil, but they learned how to work with it because they didn't have the best soil in Ireland either. <laughs> so there was a significant settlement in the harbor, and in the harbor too, there was kind of a division. There was uh, this area here, closer to the Coast Guard station and the lighthouse, would have been fairly well packed with fish docks and sheds. Um, there's a little deeper water over there. It's shallower over here easier to get boats in, but there would have been, you know, little saloons and um, what they would call shabines, which was a Gaelic word for kind of a pub that was in somebody's house, basically somebody's kitchen. Do you know how that's spelled? Uh, S-H-E-B-E-E-B-E-N. S-H-E-B-E-E-N. That's probably a phonetic spelling of it. Yeah. But the Gaelic would be a little more complex. Um... So this was, there was a lot more business going on here, and it, from what I heard, it was a little rougher part of town. This would have been the late 1800s. This would have been the 1880s and 90s. And um, a lot of business going on there. A lot of schooners would come in there. This was a little bit more uh, the merchant area where you had some general stores near where the boat dock is now. Mm-hmm. And down on this south side of the harbor, there was a, actually a, a Mormon settlement called Troy with its own road. It was built right along this flat line. This is a flat map, essentially, that divides. The, the surveyors divided up into large squares. So they had built the road here right down to the harbor that later connected with East Side Drive, which was only a road that was built in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. Before that, it was a trail. So there were some um, Irish family second generation that, would, that built boats down here. John Runberg, who's the president of the Historical Society, is ancestors were boat builders down here around the turn of the century in the early 1900s. Um, Page Town was a little store, a small, not really even a village, but there was a store there where um, fishermen who wanted to get provisions uh, either from this part of the island or from the northern islands because there were settlements on the other islands too. Mm -hmm. It would save them the time of having to go all the way around the point and into the harbor, and they could just stop here and get what they needed. Um, there was an area down by Fox Lake called the Black Hills, which is a kind of a, it's a clearing that's more, it's growing in now, but it's still kind of visible. And we think that it was named, there's two possibilities. It might have been named after an area in Ireland called the Black Hills in the west, side of the nation, or it may have been named for 
an area in North Dakota called the Black Hills. And we think there was a family that moved here from North Dakota in the early 1900s and, and named the area Black Hills. But there were there were there was at least one or two families down there, and there's some information on the Black Hills settlement in the Helen Collar files, which is a resource that I'll connect you to. The Helen Collar archives, um, the original materials are now at Central Michigan University at the Clark Historical Library. And they have a website with some of that data posted, but not much. But it's there, and it's mm -hmm. accessible. We also have a full set of copies of those archives here. And uh, I can show you some books with her material in it. Uh, you probably want to get a copy of uh, the Journal of Beaver Island History. Ideally, you'd want to get the whole set. but the first w numbers one and two contain um, articles on place names. Okay. Do you have the first okay. one? You don't need the second, second one. one. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. So that has a um, several pages of diagrammed maps in smaller sections that will take you to all the places I mentioned and more with you know, paragraphs describing who lived there right. and who they were. Mm -hmm. and, that's very, and I'm also transcribing a a 1976 interview with some of our elders that Bill Cashman conducted where he just took some people around the island and they talked for hours about mm -hmm. who lived where, and that's very helpful. So that's a general overview of, <laughs> of uh, the... There's a lot more to it. There is a lot more detail. And there's a map um, that Bill Cashman produced in 2003 that is just names of families and where they lived and what the farms and towns were. So that copy alone will tell you as much as I did, if not more. Um, and we'll try to get those, get copies of those for you. Um, that was a really great map that he produced. He produced it in conjunction with what we call the twinning between Aaron Moore and Beaver mm -hmm. Island, which took place over 2000, 2003. Mm -hmm. So Bill's done a lot of research, uh, and he interviewed a lot of elders back in the 70s when he first moved here. and. We have a fair amount of information on who lived where, and we have land records, so those are very handy. Um, before Strang, things are fuzzy because land records weren't kept. The island hadn't even been surveyed that long. Mm -hmm. um, surveyed in 1845, and then Strang arrived in 1847. And uh, Strang had a habit of what he called consecrating property, where he would make it holy by taking it away from other people. <laughs> and uh, dedicating it to the Lord, but it was really just kind of a land grab. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, you know, the Irish, I think the, the cultural traditions they had defined where they lived and why they lived where they did and why they chose to remain kind of... They were insular people generally. The fact that they moved here is proof of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but even amongst themselves, you know, they're more defined, they were more defined by family connection mm -hmm. than even ethnic identity to some extent. So, and in those days, the ability to build a town was a really amazing, you know, it was quite an opportunity, so um, to establish their own, it, they were tribal, you know, they were very tribal people, and tribes are based on family affiliation mm -hmm. first, and then they grow from there. So I think that's one of the reasons that they built these little townlands in different places. And again, it must have been a very difficult life because uh, conditions were harsh, but um, they spread out. And later, in later years, they, you know, they, they grew in population. Around 1900, I think there were 2,000 people living on Beaver Island. Probably 70 to 80 percent of them were Irish descendants. And they began to congregate a little more toward the harbor. But there were still a lot of farms down here in by World War II, right after World War II, that all faded away. The fishing had collapsed mm -hmm. due to overfishing the lamprey eel and perhaps mm -hmm. an environmental degradation. And um, when the sons came back from World War II, they just kind of looked around and said, there's nothing really here for us. So they moved to the cities like Chicago and Detroit to work in auto plants and industry. And that was kind of the end of you know, I would say from like 1856 to 1945 would have been the height of um, Irish residency and commerce and industry here. And after that, it really kind of became a ghost town. Um, I was born in 1965, and I think there were 
around 200 people living here year-round at that time. Mm -hmm. There weren't that many. Then a lot of the farms had just been abandoned, and the land had, um, the families had just ceased paying taxes on them because they'd moved off, so a lot of the land went back to the state mm -hmm. for back taxes. Um, and the population slowly crept up from, you know, 1950 onward, or 1960 onward, but very slowly, and it really... So probably around 400 right now, 450 around residents. Summer residents are a much mm -hmm. higher number. So there are many places that would be great, you know, to dig at. Even as I was telling Deb last night, my the, my, the backyard of my family home, which is right across the street where I grew up, um, we found a lot of stuff there, digging up ditches and water lines in the 1970s, clay pipes and uh, other artifacts that probably still there under the soil. So there's a lot more to be discovered here. But in terms of data and outlines and overall patterns, there's a lot of information that we have that would help you with your you know, constructing the picture you're trying to put together here. And um, let's see. Little Sand Bay, which is where you guys are digging mm -hmm. right now. Um, right around here. This would have been pretty well fished, Sand Bay. There were there were a lot of fishermen down there. The McDonough family had a little farmstead. That's another one I should mention too. Um, right around here was a fa was a, the Bestie McDonough family. His name was Sylvester, mm -hmm. and he built a farm there. And he had a he also had a little fishing operation out here, and he had a large family. So. Um, in later years, you know, you might be called by, you know, your ancestors, like, nickname like, oh, he's a vestie or she's a vestie, or <laughs> Pudgenog also is an important ancestor. Um, he had built a farm here on, actually he built a farm on Sloptown Road, although they named the road south of him Pudgenog. He, his name is Patrick Boyle, and Pudgenog is a Gaelic term for, um, I think it's young Patrick. Mm -hmm. And he was very prolific. He was an Aaron Moore immigrant who had lost two sons and a wife in a very short period of time on Aaron Moore to, um, to accident, drowning, and suicide. So he left there, and he moved over here, and he started over again. And he had, I don't know the exact number of his kids, but he had a large family, and they had large families, and they had large families. So a lot of Beaver Island descendants are what they, we, they still call Pudgeon Arc. You don't hear that too much anymore, but once in a while, um, I can remember people saying, oh, that's how Pudgeon Arc would do it, or <laughs> uh, typical Pudgeon Arc, you know, or Pudgeen, I'd say, you Pudgeens, and they would have been, you know, people from, that were living in this area of the island that later spread out. He was kind of a legendary figure. He died, I think, in 1894, but they celebrated his birthday up until the 1950s. Oh, wow. So he was that... Oh. Kind of uh, important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was like a trunk of a very large family tree. Mm -hmm. So that's a start, I guess. Um, gives you a general idea, and we could we could go down to the museum and we could do some you know more recording with the map, um, with uh, the place name map if you like, or we could meet again and and uh, you know, with maps and a little more detailed information, whatever you prefer. Sure. Um. We have a couple more questions now, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I'm curious about what do you know about from the first generation's tree migration? Like, were there a lot of letters sent back, and what did the people living on the island have a lot to do with more people coming? Yes, they did. And um, it, it seems uh, uh, there's a misconception today, I think, that communication was really slow and laborious. Mm -hmm. And it was slower, but what you need to remember is that the Great Lakes were like a superhighway. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of marine traffic going from Chicago through the Straits of Mackinac to Buffalo, Niagara Falls, out the St. Lawrence Seaway, and then, you know, by Buffalo through a series of canals to New York State. So there was a constant traffic going back and forth with trade and commerce. So it wasn't that difficult to get uh, messages back and forth. It might have taken weeks or months, mm -hmm. but it was going on. Okay. There was transit all the time. So there was, you know, uh, I'm pretty convinced that there was a fairly uh, well-developed communication channel between um, Beaver Island and uh, New York and points in between. So 
after the first wave arrived here, they began sending back word along uh, that route, that communication route, travel route, to New York State, where other air and more people had settled. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, the place that they settled in New York City was pretty rough. It was, some of it was around what they called the Five Points area, which was where a lot of gang activity was going on. And they were treated pretty badly. You know, there was a lot of anti-Catholic and Irish prejudice in New York City. So they would, the first families did, in fact, send back word. There was land here. There was an entire town. There was a settlement, really, just here for the taking. Because the Mormons had cleared a lot of land, they had built roads, they had dug canals, they had uh, created an infrastructure on the island, built homes, built log cabins like the one you're working on. And it was there for the taking. I mean, there were plates on the table. Because the Irish, the Mormons were evicted very quickly. Right. In a matter of seven days, they were driven out. So all their possessions were still there. And yeah, they sent word back. And there were three major waves of migration, which you can find information about in the Helicopter mm -hmm. Archives. But the first one would have been 1856 to 58, 59, 60. And then one in the 1860s, and I think one in 1883, roughly. And um, one of the one of the first generation immigrants was this captain, uh, sailboat captain, and he actually chartered a vessel to go back to Donegal and pick up a bunch of people mm -hmm. years after he had been established. And then later on, a local merchant named James Dormer, who was a wealthy uh, businessman who handled fishing, he sold wheat fish to the major markets in Chicago and elsewhere. He arranged to have a vessel take more immigrants over. So in three, in three large um, groups, they, they came. And they trickled in between those three points, too. I think the last immigrant was around 1900 to 1910, and she would have been Mary Duffy. It might have been 1890, but right around the turn of the century, she would have been the last immigrant, to my knowledge, and the last one that spoke Gaelic. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a woman named Mary Early who lived until 1977. I think she spoke Gaelic too. She was she came to the island in 1884 at the age of four, and she died in 1977. I remember her, but I think she moved off the island before she died. Um, so either Mary Duffy or Mary Early were the last Gaelic-speaking people, and by the time they died, hardly anyone knew the language. Mm -hmm. I know Dr. Rotten told, um, she's mentioned before, and she isn't, she isn't sure if this is true or not, but she's heard a story about um, whatever priest was here was complaining about no one coming to Mass, and then so they brought in an Irish-speaking one. Do you know anything about that? Yep. Um, this, this church that we're in now was originally outside of town at where the Catholic cemetery is now, and it was built in 1860. And um, so four years after Strang was mm -hmm. killed, and they had an interim, there. I think it was Father Murray, that was the first Catholic priest here. And um, I don't think he was Irish. I may be wrong about that, but I think it was a Father Murray in there. At any rate, he wasn't that well liked by the Irish people. Mm -hmm. So um, Father Peter Gallagher came in 1866. And he's quite a character. He was not what you would call the, mo the most likely person to be a priest. He, uh, <laughs> but he became a very powerful figure. He became perhaps the most powerful figure on Beaver Island for 32 years when he was the head of the church. He, he was a businessman. He had a small schooner in the harbor here, which he used for commerce and trade and selling things. Um, he liked to drink. He liked to eat well. He had a little farm, I think, out by the church. And he was a power broker. He really just kind of amassed power over the years. He spoke fluent Gaelic. He wasn't from Aaron North. I think mm -hmm. He was from County Tyrone. And anyone outside of Donegal, that part of Donegal, would have had a little better education than people in Donegal because Donegal was a little bit like Appalachia. Mm -hmm. It was geographically isolated, so there wasn't a lot of, you know, flow of people through there, kind of insulated. But he was from Tyrone, I believe, and so he had a, a decent education, although he did not, you know, graduate from seminary at the top of his class by any means. I think he was a guy who was kind of just looking for a niche. And uh, he was a very large man, and he had a group of loyal 
followers, henchmen, who were called Gallagher's boys. And they were kind of his muscle. So he had conflicts with some of the Islanders because he was really kind of a, you know, a strong-arm guy. Um, but and, but they, they had a hard time dislodging him and replacing him because he was really firmly entrenched here. And, you know, the story is that he... Uh, he was pretty good at intimidating those who were his critics. So there were two instances where the diocese of uh, Grand Rapids set up uh, another priest to replace him. But they were essentially told to go. You know, the, the priests mm-hmm. were not allowed to, to take position here. Um, and uh, you can read more about him and a book that I cited to Deb last night, um, the Paul Connor's thesis. I think she's read it, but there's an entire chapter on Father Gallagher. Um, so he would have been, you know, one of the early uh, priests in this church, which was much smaller at the time. But he held sway here from 1866 to 1898 when he died of food poisoning. And that sent the community into a panic because they were, he'd been there for 32 years, mm-hmm. you know, which in a community of people whose average lifespan was 50 or 60 was a long, long time. So they didn't know what to do. And eventually the, they sent a new priest in, Father Alexander Zugelder, who came in ni- 1898 or 1899. I think he came from lower Michigan. And he was what you would call a builder priest. He was an engineer, and he knew how to build things, and he developed and expanded the size of this church, and he built a fieldstone rectory out by the cemetery and a a building for the nuns that came up from Grand Rapids and began teaching school. So he created quite a compound, and he stayed here until 1905. But when Father Gallagher died, that was kind of the end of the, the height of the Irish hegemony on Beaver Island. You know, he mm-hmm. spoke Gaelic, and he said mm-hmm. Mass in Gaelic, and he married people, and he brokered business deals, and he um, he really just kind of ran the town, from what we can tell. And his photos in there, I think, photos in the foyer mm-hmm. when you come in. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit of the outline about him. Do you know if there is, um, since he was so powerful, but was there any sort of... Um, spirit of kind of independence here or rebellion just since it was an isolated part do you think people tried he, to do things their own way well they did do things their own way you know the Irish that came here were very mistrustful of government authority they'd been abused by right. the British uh, colonization for 700 years they'd been abused by um, you know the, the government on mainland Ireland they were very mistrustful of any kind of outside authority and very, they were very tribal people very insulated tribal people so that's why they came here, because they wanted to recreate their environment here in the United States. And I think they considered themselves loyal Americans, but I don't think that their primary identity was in Americans first. They had huge celebrations on the 4th of July, but I think they were celebrating more their, their independence mm-hmm. from everything right. <laughs> than um, England. Although, yeah, they were happy to be free from England, but they were they ran... You know, they were part of the state government and they were part of the county, but we they got very little support or, or funds from either level of government, and they didn't really want it. Um, so they they had two townships here, as they still do, and they ran those townships. They built their own schools, um, and certain families would rise to prominence and power and hold sway for a certain number of years and subside, and others would take their place. But it was, really was a, a very much an independent place. And, um, you know, newcomers were sometimes viewed with suspicion. And if you weren't Irish Catholic and you attempted to move here, that was difficult. Yeah. It wasn't easy for the French Canadians you know, at first. Um, they had to fight to assimilate here. But sometimes, you know, the immigrants, the other immigrants that came from other areas other than Ireland, had a little better education, so they be, they rose into the merchant class more quickly, and had an ad- advantage that way. Some of them were educators, and but very much uh, an insulated, self-sufficient community. They did, you know, need uh, and took advantage of supplies that would come from the mainland. I mean, they had to be part of that system, but 
they grew their own food, they made a lot of their own clothes, they made their own alcohol in large quantities, and they had their own music. So it was essentially a transplanted culture, which is unusual. And the thing that makes Bieber Island unique is that it's a unique subset of the larger Irish immigrant story, mm -hmm. which, you know, the commonly understood you know, themes are, well, they went to the East Coast and they settled mm -hmm. Boston and took power there, and the Kennedys came from this, you know, city. And that's all that's true, but it's pretty unusual for one island to transplant itself to another island. And, um, you know, and then the whole families were split in half. Some half the families might have stayed in Aramore and half might have come here. So it was a long lasting, it held sway for a long time, largely because of its geographic isolation, because there wasn't a lot of influx of other people. It wasn't on the mainland. It wasn't, it didn't have a, a railway running through it. It had ships coming and going, but the Irish really kind of kept it to themselves for well, I know, 130, 140 years. And even in my childhood, it was still largely Irish Catholic community, which it still is, but it's, you know, my demographic is fading now. It's mm -hmm. becoming more diverse and homogenized. But I always find, you know, I occasionally come across bits of information that reveal a lot to me. Like a few years ago, somebody came across the name of a hill. This is Macaulay Road near the end of King's Highway, which goes to the east down to the lake shore. And apparently, I can't recall the name of this hill. It's in our archives somewhere, but they, it was kind of something like Lookout Hill, only it was named after another hill in the United States that was used as a lookout point for military maneuvers. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that curious, and I researched it, and I found that... Um, this had been a place where the Irish, I think, had fought for the colonists against the British on the mm -hmm. East Coast. So that suggested to me that in the first generation, they were still really wary. You know, this was in the mid-19th century when all sorts of rebellions were going on across mm -hmm. the country and people were still trying to take each other's land. So this may have been an area where they had, like, a lookout post and there wasn't as much forest on the bluff in those days and they could see all the ships coming up and down and they keep an eye on everything that's going on. So they were insulated, and they were kind of wary, and they were protective of the island. And, uh, yeah, they, they ran their own little kingdom. I wouldn't call it, they wouldn't have called it a kingdom. But they ran their own little universe here. And um, they, they were really, that was it. There was the Irish Catholic community. There were, of course, Native Americans here, too, but... That's another layer of history. You know, there was certainly <laughs> isolation and prejudice and segregation that went on there. Um, and there's not you know, that, those things we know, but I'm curious about the nuances of how a multicultural society existed here in Beaver Island in the mid-19th century because there were Native Americans, there were Irish, there were French Canadians, there were Germans, you know, and they apparently got along well enough to all survive. Um, and, as I said, the Indians taught the Irish what they needed to know to survive, fishing and even the farming and what plants grew here that were medicinal and so forth. So it was kind of an experiment. You know, a lot of things in the United States were an experiment in the, 19th, in the 1800s. Everybody was trying to figure out how to design this country and create a country. And um, it's, it's, it's ironic that Strang came here to, because it was isolated, to mm -hmm. form his own kingdom, which was a religious colony. And the Irish, you know, despised that. They really resented him for what they considered him to be a cult leader and a religion they did not understand, which was really very recent. It was only 10 or 20 years old, mm -hmm. a uniquely American religion. And they, he was, you know, a poly polygamist, and they didn't like that. But after he was run, killed and the Mormons were run off, they, they set up their own kind of kingdom, in a way. Only there wasn't one figure over it. There were several in succession. But everybody wants to rule the world, and this was their world. And they, you know, they did it. They, they did it okay. They succeeded fairly well. And this place existed in kind of mythic terms for the Aaron Mar Irish for a long time, until the mid-20th century. Um, when more travel was thrown out back and forth. But if you said the word Beaver Island and Aaron Moore, it would be immediately everybody would be you know, interested in you and <laughs> want, to, want to talk to you and ask you who your ancestors were. And so, 
a lot of research done, but lots more to do. Definitely. So, um, would you mind talking a little bit more about your personal ancestors and their experience on the island? Well, yeah, three of my four grandparents are from Aaron Moore, or three of my those lines, <laughs> those lineages from Aaron. My dad's father, my dad's grandfather, Garrett Paul, settled this, created a small village down here in 1912. Uh, sawmill, and he named the town Nomad. But the other three, um, my dad's mother was a Gillespie, and my mother's both my mother's parents were Conahan and Malloy, so they're all from Aaron Moore. Most of my lineage is from Aaron Moore. And I remember both my grandmothers, uh, they're both gone now, but my mother's mother was a Malloy, and she married a McConaughey, and she was she remembers she was born in 1891, so she kind of remembers parts of that. She remembered parts of that era, the fishing era, and the schooners. And um, I grew up, you know, hearing a lot of stories from my family and from other families on the island, and uh, you know, a pretty deep sense of heritage. Um, of American Irishness, which wasn't, is it, it's different than, you know, Irishness. I always take pains to say that I'm an American Irish person, but I uh, grew up hearing a lot of those old songs that they would have sung in Ireland, and the cause of Irish nationalism was still strong here. The, the jukebox in the tavern had a lot of Irish rebel songs on it. <laughs> so that ethos, that ethos, and that mentality was still really strong here when I was growing up. And some of the cultural traditions were still intact because it was a small town, but also because it was an Irish small town. You could walk down the street and stop in anybody's home without calling ahead or announcing yourself, then you'd be welcome there. And the church was still pretty much the center of the Catholic community in my childhood. Um, they would have dances down here at the hall. They would have weddings here and wedding receptions. And a lot of social activity happened around the church. And my family had a commercial fishing business, which um, it was another tradition that went back on both sides of my family. So I worked on the lakes growing up, and I I grew up kind of, you know, in a town or in, a, in an America that had vanished in most other places. And when I say it was behind the times, I don't mean that derogatorily. I mean that a lot of traditions that had disappeared from most other communities um, were still extant here, were still thriving here, again, because of our isolation and our tight-knit nature. Um, you know, homogenization and assimilation, assimilation occurred more quickly for other immigrant groups in, in mainland areas of the nation, uh, but it occurred much more slowly here. So, I, you know, I often look back and say the older I get, the luckier I was. Um, it wasn't all great, it wasn't all roses, but it was a unique cultural experience within the larger body of the United States that I think very few people got to got to have in my lifetime, in my time period. In my mother's time, you know, when she grew up during the Depression, there were still lots of farm towns all across the country where you'd, you'd be riding around on horses or, you know, but by the 1970s, that was pretty unusual. But I can remember, you know, I grew up across the street and going down to school here and going to church here and being born in a little tiny medical center right over there. So very, talk of, you know, very small area and ringing the bell for recess, doing things like that that, you know, just totally old school. So I felt like I grew up in the United States of maybe the 1930s or 40s, although I was growing up in the 1970s. Um, and I'm grateful for that. You know, I have a lot to be thankful for. It's a tribal culture. It's still, you know, the clans are still here, and uh, um, I don't live here anymore, but I try to maintain connections with them as best I can, and um, my brothers, so, so, you know, my brothers are very uh, good about fostering and maintaining tradition and trying to hold on to what's, what can be held on to, and they were, they played a major role in the twinning that went on over the early part of this decade between Aaron Moore and Beaver. So we all recognize that, you know, the demographic is changing and that we're kind of dying out. But, um, you know, all you can do is really celebrate what you have while you have it. And um, 
been my way of trying to honor it was through historical research and trying to save uh, save stories through oral history and also through collecting data and ultimately maybe down the road synthesizing it more because there's a lot of material that just hasn't been connected or put into book form or narrative form for the general public, which I think is really important. So that's my way of trying to uh, respect it. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to me to be able to look at someone who's 15 years old, who's from an island family, and I can, because I've gone through hundreds if not thousands of photographs of their ancestors, I can see Bestie McDonough in their face. They may not even see it. They wouldn't know it, but I can see that. And I can see combinations of people in their faces, you know, from the Boyle and O'Donnell and Gallagher clans. Um, and that's fascinating to me, you know, in, a, in an organic sense to see that, you know, how we are as a species, that we just keep re. Our ancestors don't really die, they just keep popping up in our faces. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in our temperament and personality, yeah. too. Um, and to have grown up in a tribal culture, I wouldn't have considered or, or called it a tribal culture when I was growing up. I don't think I understood that very well. But now I understand that, you know, it's a, the Native Americans had tribal culture here. We had a tribal culture here, uh, familial relations, and I'm related to a lot of people that live here. You know, it's a large, extended family is what it is. So it was unique, and um, that group at the time I grew up, it was almost, like I said, it was kind of an abandoned town. So it was, it was kind of spooky, you know. It was a little eerie going downtown and seeing buildings boarded up and all these old farms on the countryside uh, just fading away and crumbling into dirt. And, and that's another thing. We used to call this, everything south of St. James was the country. We called that the countryside, you know. Even though it was just an island, uh, we called that, that's out in the country. Yeah. That's a phrase that I don't hear anymore, but we always use this. We're going out to the country. So... My dad would take us down here to Nomad, where he kind of grew up as a kid, which was banished by my lifetime. But one had a, you had a sense of visiting these old, almost a series of tiny little ghost towns and uh, little cabins that were just crumbling and old Mormon homes that were fading away. And It's one of the few places in, in America where a thriving culture existed and cleared the land, and then nature came and took it back. So it's of great interest to biologists for that reason. Yeah. So now it's part of history, and uh, it's interesting for me to be able to take people here. I have a friend here from Ann Arbor this week, and I've been showing her the museum, and she said, this is so weird seeing, you know, you're talking, this is, as you show me the museums, you're talking about your own history, um, like the school desk upstairs in the museum. You know, I sat at desks like that. I, I, I used some of the tools that were in that museum um, for fishing and other things. So... It's literally a living history to me. And in the process of spending years collecting history, I realized that I was rebuilding the town in my mind. And kind of a holographic image in my mind of where everything was, who was where. And so those people kind of came to life for me. And, um, you know, you can get too deep into history, actually, because it's a lonely endeavor. It's a... Uh, there aren't a lot of people around you who, mm -hmm. uh, who have your, your your knowledge base, so you can't necessarily converse with people about it, or they're just not interested. You know, it's just history is not of interest to them. But to me, it's still alive, and there's a great was a great folk storyteller and, and singer named Utah Phillips, who um, wrote a great essay called "The Past Didn't Go Anywhere," and that's how I feel about it. The past didn't really go anywhere; it's still here as you find as you are doing your dig out there at that farmhouse. It's still there, just underneath your feet, you know. <laughs> and maybe you're not finding a ton of material there. Maybe you'll find more somewhere else later. But every time you pick, I pick up a bead or find a coin or a piece of chert from the Native Americans, you know, I realize that human hands held that. And so it brings it to life for me. And, uh, we've been fortunate in that we've had a very dedicated group of people who have collected history here over the years, other small towns don't have what we have. They don't have the buildings. They don't have the huge genealogy database. But because it was so unique and interesting and multi-level, you know, Native American, Mormon, Irish, and um, it brought people here who became dedicated to saving it. And I think that's a real blessing. And there's always more. You know, there's always more to discover. 
Yeah, because there hasn't been a huge amount of development here. You know, it hasn't been paved over like Dr. Brighton's yeah. situation. Yeah, sure. You know, a Walmart on one side and a Lowe's on the other. It's just it's so sad to see that just paved over. It'll never be recovered. You know, but that hasn't happened here that much. And uh, even when they repaved the roads here in the harbor in the 2000, 2001, they dug really deep to build these roads, and we found. Um, we found things down there that we didn't expect to see, like uh, weight scales, old wooden weight scales in front mm -hmm. of the uh, boat dock where they would drive their wagons into town with produce and, and they would weigh them, you know, and put them on the boat or sell them. We never knew they were there. There was no record of it. And, and we just figured out by looking at it and Google imaging it that that's probably what it was. So it's all still down there. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll probably wrap up sure. there for right now. Yeah. Um,